and dear friends. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be amongst you for this very prestigious uh, Dr. Pinto Memorial Lecture. I was very impressed to read uh, his uh, background. Being a doctor, he contributed so much to the field of literature, poem and all that. So sometimes actually Dr. Ajit Kumar came to receive me today. So I said what a coincidence that uh, uh, I am going for a memorial lecture for one doctor who contributed so much to literature. There is another doctor who has come to receive me who is a painter and he has come to receive a third doctor who is more not known as a doctor at all. So that's a very funny thing which is happening but of course life is like that because we ultimately tend to choose the area of work which touches us the best and that's what probably what we are honoring Dr. Pinto's memory because what touched him very deeply was the social issues which got expression through his literature, poetry and other contribution in the society. Now coming to today's talk, uh, uh, challenges to Indian nationalism. Now is, it, is there a challenge to Indian nationalism or is it that some people are just imagining there is a challenge to Indian nationalism? That is the question number one. But recently it came forward again. Uh, I hope you recall that uh, 25th June, this uh, which went past by, this year many of the top leaders started comparing the emergency of 1975 with Hitler's fascism and while introspecting that I tried to see of course emergency one of the worst tragedies of India's democracy, one of the worst violation of civic and democratic rights. While comparing that I still felt there were some things which were there in Hitler's fascism which were not there during emergency but they are seeping in the Indian society today. That's why some people are saying that emergency that we suffered for 20-22 months but currently a undeclared emergency is going on. Now what is this undeclared emergency and why people like uh, some of the social scientists are telling that whatever is going on is more comparable to what happened in Germany. So first I'll begin with that because I feel why I'm talking of Indian nationalism because I associate Indian nationalism with democracy. I associate Indian nationalism with Indian constitution. I associate Indian nationalism with the values of social justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. That is my understanding of Indian nationalism. Today what is happening is totally in contrast to that. And when I was comparing to Hitler, some people may say that this may be an unfair comparison. But see, what I don't know, some sort of thing goes back at the back of the mind. I don't know whether in sitting in Kerala, which is comparatively much, much better politically and socially so far. So far, let me add, which direction we go, I don't know. Sitting in Kerala, one may not realize that much as touring in North India, North East India, all parts of India, what one realizes that particularly during the last four years, there are some tendencies. Please try to understand that. And I see those tendencies as an unwritten violation of Indian democracy. A subtle undermining of the norms of the Indian democracy, a total attack on the values of Indian constitution. That's why I perceive in the last four years. Some of the trains at two levels I'll talk. Some trains which were visible in Germany and some trains which are going against Indian constitution. So what was visible in Germany? What is the most stark feature? Number one, corporate powers encouraged to the sky. So what is happening to the corporate world today? I did not say. Number two, rights of the workers, rights of the peasants trampled. So what is happening today? I need not tell you. Number three, ultra-nationalism. We are great and our hyper-muscular policies towards the neighbors. So attack the neighbors, frighten them, try to launch wars and try to create atmosphere of hostility. Number three, and showing your patriotism. Of course, showing the patriotism takes nothing. When it comes to being patriotic, 
that is some challenge and when that was needed during freedom movement these people were totally absent so that is very contrast show of patriotism versus a patriotic feeling to fight for independence of your country these are two separate things and last point of course there are many features which i see very disturbing the last feature i see is targeting a minority in case of germany it was jews it was jews that all the problems of germany are because of the jews so you exterminate the jews problem is solved happy society will come in today what is happening every problem is being down brought down to major religious minorities muslims and partly christians i am sure you may not feel it as much as people like us traveling the country living in north northern part of the country and at the one more point also comes up which i think people in this part of the country should realize more what is that point now as germany and hitler said we had a glorious ancient past because of the aryans right of course now this another thing aryans came from there to here or went from here to there of is of no consequence to me but the greatness of aryan race the way it is being revived the way lot of funding is being done to show that this was a glorious place of aryans that aryanism also is one of the major constituent constituent of hindu nationalism which is asserting itself in today's situation so this is a one level which i see the disturbing trends the disturbing trends about super super patriotism ultra nationalism muscular policies towards neighbors so this is at one level at another level what is happening we see number of suicides of the farmers on the rise so called labor reforms trying to snatch the rights of the workers which cult see the left movement indian workers have got during the last 90 years cult see number 1 number 3 the farmers land trying to acquire those that land for the sake of the corporate world and what is the status of the corporate you should know properly because of course you must be knowing that our prime minister Uh, he doesn't come here often i believe Look good for you anyway our prime minister keeps traveling traveling all over the world and so far the prime ministers when they were going abroad people knew who are accompanying them they are journalists they were others now nobody knows who's accompanying him i don't know what is the secret about it but there are some people who tell me that there is some this corporate person that corporate person the person who lent him the aeroplane for 2014 election campaign i hope you can name name that one or two corporates who are who are surging by leaps and bounds day and day out again so these are the people who are becoming stronger who are being becoming weaker workers total violation of workers rights peasants and what is happening to the plight of the future of our younger generation the future of younger generation now of course our prime minister says the opposition does not have a data we have created so many jobs i don't know whether you know our hindi word of pakoda pakoda he said you know even by by selling pakoda you can get so much money so much employment has been created and his junior clone has come up in tripura in tripura he says by selling milk also you can become millionaire thank you very much why does he do that rather than advising the young students who are looking for jobs who are looking for decent life you in future and all that and on the top of it what is the plight of religious minorities i am very glad again that i am in kerala today all over the country it may be muslims in main or it may be christians all of them live a life of fear and that life of fear marginalization the type of issues which have come up have created a lot of fear amongst them and whenever any community is gripped by fear whenever any community is gripped by fear the process of reform within the community takes a beating there is more of attacks more of that community shrinks like a tortoise like a tortoise tortoise keeps walking faces a threat then when it faces a threat it withdraws its head under the cover that is what is 
have the plight of religious minorities today. So what I see that today the Indian nationalism, from where does the challenge come? So this is the background in which I am trying to present the case that what is Indian nationalism? From which nationalism it faces a threat? Nationalism alone in India, nationalism alone in South Asia does not define the character of that phenomenon. It has to be prefixed, it has to be prefixed either with A or B or C or D. I will explain that what is A and B, C, D. Because if you recall, while campaigning in 2014, our Prime Minister, when he was in Bombay, he made a statement that I am born in a Hindu family. Nobody will dispute that. I am a nationalist, so I am a Hindu nationalist. Very, very interesting, very genius statement. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, was he born in a Hindu family or not? He was born. Mahatma Gandhi, did he say that he is not a Hindu? On the contrary, Gandhi said, I am a Sanatani Hindu. I can give my life for my religion, but that's my personal matter. Neither Mahatma Gandhi nor Maulana Abul Kalam Azad associated their nationalism with religion. Now, this person who is head of a political party, I don't know, head or his second in command is head of the party and he is heading the government, but he is a single person authority which is there. He openly says, I am a Hindu nationalist. That's why I said, in South Asia, you will see nationalism is prefixed with something. Either it is a secular thing or it is a religious thing. In Pakistan, in Pakistan, they will say, mullahs will say, others will say, we are Muslim nationalists. Of course, what does it go? What does it take to say, call yourself nationalist? It, it doesn't take anything. So you add the name of your religion and you are able to win also. And similarly, there is in Bangladesh also this phenomenon is there. Frighteningly, in places like Myanmar, in places like Sri Lanka, the nationalism in the name of Buddhism is also coming up. I want to clarify right in the beginning because I get a lot of abusive mails daily saying that I am against Hindus. I am not against any religion. I value the moral values of all religions. What I am against that? I am against politics in the name of religion. This politics in the name of religion in Pakistan, in the name of Islam. In Bangladesh, in the name of Islam. In Sri Lanka, Myanmar, in the name of Buddhism. So point is to distinguish between a secular democratic nationalism vis-a-vis -vis the politics in the name of religion. The second warning which I give myself that the image is being built about people like us. They are against Hindus. Very funny. But somehow I, I console myself. Though my stature will be very small, but I console myself that Mahatma Gandhi was also killed because he was projected to be anti-Hindu. So that is something which gives me consolation and peaceful night despite my stature being small. So this deliberate image of being anti-Hindu is a ploy to reject your ideas. Because when religion comes, when religion is brought in, when religion is imposed, sometimes rational thinking is stopped. This is a deliberate ploy. Oh, hysteria, mass hysteria is created. That person is against my religion. Let's kill him. Let's do this, let's do that. And this is again very akin to what happened in Germany. Do you believe 60 lakh people were subjected to gas chambers? How could it be done? Only because a mass hysteria against the Jews was created. And that mass hysteria is a job of propaganda, is a pro job of multiple organizations which take it upon themselves to de develop this narrow sectarian nationalism. So this is what brings me to what, how did, how did Indian nationalism come in? And what is its competing Hindu nationalism? Why this Hindu nationalism was not prominent till 1980s? Why? Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic communalism was prominent in Pakistan right from the beginning. Why Buddhist fundamentalism is coming up more in Myanmar? These are the his matters of serious concern. So I will focus myself on Indian nationalism. <clears throat> First, let me tell you that nationalism is a modern phenomenon. Now, some of us are trying to take us to the past. 
from the ancient glorious past we are we were a hindu nation excellent now of course here i don't know by talking in kerala i don't mind talking about darwin because darwin tells us who were our ancestors i have no problem with those ancestors also i am very happy that you are living on the trees fresh fruit no pollution you can jump from here to there with ease there is no tension there is no tension of attending a boring lecture there is no tension of wearing the clothes i have no problem with that also but that cannot be called a nation that has its own beauty that is its own charm but after that comes a stage of hunter food gatherer so there are different groups different tribes going to the forest collecting fruits killing animals and eating that time nobody was saying okay don't kill that animal that is our mother that that those type of feelings are not anyway so that is one stage of society and that claim that we are a ancient nation from that time is a total distortion of basic understanding of human society human society begins whatever we say as a hunter food gatherer goes on to nomadic tribes and these nomadic tribes which are like in indian case the whole aryan debate this note aryan debate is not being imposed for the sake of any great social scientific research aryan debate is being brought to impose certain values aryans were also nomadic tribes whether they went from here to that side or that side to this side it was not due to nationalism please note aryans migrated because of the greener grass yeah these hindu nationalists will be will be shocked to say that they were also in search of greener grass grass like our of us like of course we we go to america our children go to america they go to europe not in search of a glorifying a nationalism but in search of a greener grass in the modern language of better jobs better living opportunities etc etc anyway so this indian nationalism please know it should not be equate, equated to the rule of hindu kings now if because i am going into all this detail let me first clarify two couple of things number one the word hindu itself is not there in the so called hindu scriptures the word hindu comes somewhere around 8th century it is a derivative from the word sindhu and it was given by this word was coined by the people coming from west asia they were coming to this side they crossed the sindhu river the biggest landmark and they identified this land as, 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 as in the name of this river in their language sir sir is used but sir is used less often and in place of that sometimes her is used her so what does sindhu become hindu so hindu was first origin was that for a land it was not a religion please note again because hinduism is being misinterpreted lot of things are being said let me tell you that hindu religion is very different from many other religions like the prophet based religions prophet based religions christianity islam buddhism sikhism where one single prophet he brings a message there is a single holy book and there is a defined norms now hindu is a other type of religion hindu word is given to different religious tendencies which were prevalent here please note that since there is no prophet lord ram lord krishna they are our heroes in that sense they are not the prophets they are gods themselves so that's the difference between jesus christ prophet muhammad guru nanak lord gautam buddha etc etc so hindu is a compilation bringing together of different tendencies what are these different tendencies roughly i'll say there are two type of tendencies in hinduism tendency number 1 dominant as ambedkar puts it uh, according to ambedkar hinduism is brahminic theology what appears what is projected what is imposed is brahminism what is brahminism brahminism is defined in vedas rigved purush sukt tells us that there is a the caste structure varna system was created by lord brahma himself i hope i don't have to explain that we have a tribe of gods one creates another maintains third one destroys 
like of course other theologies have also this thing greek mythology or others also have one god to create one to maintain another to destroy again this is a development of the concept of the god which again of course today it will be different okay so lord brahma himself he has created the caste so who are we to abolish it so that's why it becomes a divine system so brahmanism is the value which is based on the hierarchy of caste and gender i know hierarchy word is not easy hierarchy for example in the university there is a vice chancellor professor assistant professor and the peon this is a hierarchy but this is a functional hierarchy peon son can become vice chancellor tomorrow if the society is correct if society is on the correct path but the hierarchy which i am mentioning is a birth based hierarchy right from birth if you are a peasant you have to salute the land lord right from birth if you are a shudra you are the slave of the brahmins and the upper caste and if you happen to be a woman you are shudra ati shudra means i don't know this uh, this will be given means among shudras also the lowest category comes to the women who are supposed to be the property of man so that is a hierarchy which prevails in the times which we are talking so brahmanism on one side what is brahmanism symbolized by caste and gender hierarchy the other hindu traditions nath tantra siddh bhakti these are away from brahmanic tradition and they harp on the equality of the people in which saints like kabir tukaram namdev narsi mehta and similar way other saints also talked about equality so the word hindu is not there in the so called hindu scripture still we say Hey, we are a Hindu nation from times immemorial, right? So that's fantastic thing. Now, after this comes the word. So first word, a Hindu comes as a land. Second word, Hindu comes as a combination of different religious tendencies. And third, which comes up in 1923, it is become becomes more prominent. That word is Hindu Twa. That way, I don't know. You must be hearing these. There is a lot of confusion whether Hindu Twa is a religion or a politics. I'll explain. Hindutva is a politics of the declining sections of Indian society who want to maintain caste and gender hierarchy in the modern language. This is a very complex sentence. I know I myself will be difficult to decipher what I said, but that's precisely what it is. So the Hindu kingdom, Hindu kings, do not symbolize Hindu nation. Please note, nation itself is a modern concept. when people are well connected with each other how are people connected in india today telephone communication transport etc etc so when the feeling of oneness comes through these things that's when the nation state begins and nation state is a modern phenomenon so number one there were hindu kings and the greatest emperor which uh, amartya sen tells us in india had the india names uh, amartya sen names two great emperors one was ashoka and second akbar right this is his definition i of course will be reluctant to call emperors great or less great because i am totally opposed to the feudal system of exploitation today when kings are being glorified what comes passes as a package is also the feudal system which is based on the severe exploitation of at indian in indian context of the caste and also of the peasants at uh, different particular levels so this era of kingdoms era of kingdoms cannot be called nation there were hindu kings there were muslim kings in indian context context and if we see that if we see particularly medieval times i will not go to the ancient period and because this again was a great mischief i will explain to that that ancient period is being looked up as hindu period then medieval period is being looked as muslim period in the modern period it is presented as a british period not as a christian period that was very great cleverness with which they tried to periodize indian history so in kings hindu or muslim they were at least in medieval times they were ruling in alliance with each other now that was a period of kingdoms and after kingdoms with that comes the era of the colonial period when i come to the colonial period i'll explain how two types of nationalism came so colonial period when we come obviously british come here 
And when British come here, I generally try to explain, and also I want to propagate just now because I was coming, I saw the uh, uh, MP office of your uh, Trivendram MP, Shashi Tharoor, one of his book is Dark, Dark Period of Empire or something like that, I always forget the name of that. Huh? Era of darkness, yeah, right, thank you very much. So, Era of darkness, he tells us that British took away the wealth from here, and that was their primary goal. Now, here I compare again, Prime Minister comes to my mind, keep haunting me. He says that for India was a slave for last 1200 years, and now, of course, which is coming, the Hindu period has begun. That's probably he keeps in the bracket. Now, can the kingdoms be called as an era of slavery of the country? That's my question. They were Muslim kings, they were Hindu kings. But is it that they were ruling for religion? Question number one. Is it that the whole partitions were around this? Now this is where I will try to bring in that kingdoms were primarily based on system of exploitation and medieval period, Hindu kings, Muslim kings had a great amount of alliance also. Fighting also, alliance also. One example I'll give, bear with me for North India, and this example is very important for to us to understand that kingdoms are kingdoms, religion is immaterial for the king. What is important for the king, I will try to explain. And let me, I hope a bit of a history I'll impose upon you. Uh, I named one emperor just now, uh, Ashoka and second, Akbar. Now, Akbar, when we say, and recently in Rajasthan, Rajasthan textbook, a lot of research is being done. Uh, when I go to Jaipur, I see the name of that airport, uh, Maharana Pratap Airport. I remember Maharana Pratap and I salute him because people regard him as great. Now, what is the research going on in Rajasthan? Level of research also you see. They say we will not call Akbar great. We will call Maharana Pratap as great. We will not say that Maharana Pratap was defeated in Haldi Ghati. We will say that God won and Akbar got defeated. I said I have no problem. Who wins, who defeats, what I have to take, I am not going to benefit from it. But where are they fighting for religion? That is my question. So I take you to, bit of bear the history with me, I take you to Haldi Ghati in Rajasthan. A battle is going on. On one side there is army of Akbar. Other side there is army of Maharana Pratap. I try to examine them. And when I try to examine them, I see that in the army of Akbar, Akbar himself is missing. Now this research I have not done. Why he did not come to that battle? Why he did not come to battle? Was he unwell? Was he on sick leave? Was he on casual leave? I really don't know. And I don't want to do research on that also. Akbar is missing. Who is representing him? Who is leading the army? There is a general called Raja Man Singh in charge of Akbar's army. And in Akbar's army, apart from Raja Man Singh, there are many Muslim generals, many Muslim armies here. So, uh, can I make the point that in Akbar's side, Muslims are also there, Hindus are there, are also there? Yes, no? Yes. On Maharana Pratap side, I come, I see that now I have to say great Maharana Pratap. No problem. I have absolutely no problem. Great Maharana Pratap is here and the name of his general is Hakim Khan Su. I am confused. I am dazed. Sometimes I feel dizzy. So, there are Hindus on both sides? Yes or no? Yes. There are Muslims on both sides? Yes. So, is it a battle between Hindus and Muslims or is it a battle between two kings? Battle between two kings. Is it a battle for power or is it a battle for religion? It is a battle for power. Somebody should tell our Prime Minister's tribe that, hello, kings, we are not fighting for religion. Kings, we are fighting for power and wealth. This basic thing if they learn, I think our Indian nationalism will become strong. That is my way of putting it. Because I don't know how to save Indian nationalism under the onslaught of this type of Hindu nationalism. But anyway, basically. So kings were fighting for power. Is it that it was exclusive? Hindus on one side, Muslims on one side. Come on, hello, we'll fight with each other. I don't think it was like that. And then again, I come back to none other than Akbar himself. I hope this botheration of history in the schools also we have to learn history. I am also imposing history upon it. But this is very simple history. Akbar had nine jewels in his court. Yes or no? Yes. Some of them were Hindus. Can you name them? Birban. Very popular. And the second one who was more important, we don't know the name of that courtier, Navratnavan, Raja Todarman. 
Let me inform you, Raja Todarmal in Akbar's court, Raja Todarmal in Akbar's court was doing the same type of work which Mr. Arun Jaitley is doing in Modi government. So that's my way of looking at history. There is a Hindu, there is a Muslim, and the king is a Muslim. So this type of a uh, thing, one more example I'll impose upon you, and that is that of Tipu Sultan. Probably you may be closer to you. In North India, Tipu Sultan is hated. Uh, Tipu Sultan converted so many Brahmins, he murdered so many Brahmins, and British people have got the record of that. Then I tried to understand Tipu Sultan. First thing which I came to know, that the name of his chief advisor was a, was Purnaya, who was a Brahmin. Hello? Is he, is he going to murder Brahmins when his chief advisor is a Brahmin? First thing he has to murder his chief advisor before going to going for the head, head of other Brahmin. So then I realized why Tipu Sultan has been demonized so much. Please note, Tipu Sultan has been the only king of this country who died while fighting the British. British did not like him at all because he kept opposing the East Indian Company's armies, their rule all through. Uh, that, that way. So now this is what kingdom is. Now our perception of kingdoms, that is Hindu period, Muslim period, how did it come in? Now I must tell you there is a Greek word called divide at empera. Divide at empera, what does it mean? If you want to rule the other countries, what, what policy you should follow? Divide and rule. And for divide and rule, what policy to apply? apply? Well, that is called communal historiography. What is communal historiography? Communal historiography means looking at kings through the prism of religion. Why was that king bad? Because he was a Muslim. Why that king was good? Because he was a Hindu. Because here there is a very beauty that you are able to hide the relations of exploitation between a peasant and a landlord and the king and you are totally focused on the non-important non thing called religion of the king. Anyway, so British come here, point I was trying to make that Muslim kings who came here were of two types. One type of Muslim kings came, plundered, went away. Plundering unusual for king? Is it that only Muslim kings are plundering? Loot mar, what we call in Hindi? Please note, all armies plunder. Yes or no? Think of for yourself. So there were some Muslim kings who came, plundered, went away. But those Muslim kings who ruled this part of the country, they settled here, lived here, and died here. So I don't know how to define slavery of the country because first time the systematic loot and plunder of the country took place with the British. So according to me, the plunder slavery of the country begins with the British. British come here, they see what we call golden bird, Hindi it is called Soniki Chidiya. They made all the arrangement, but of course, I don't see any, any event of history just in black color or white color. There are shades of grey. British come here, they have to take away the property from here. So in order to take away the property, wealth, richness from here, they introduce three changes. This I say in a popular way, so that probably some of it, this lecture may remain with you. So these three changes are what? One is transport, to be remembered as rain. rain. Second is communication. Telephone, telegraph, postal system, etc., to be remembered as mail. And third is modern education, modern judiciary, modern bureaucracy, and the culmination that comes in the form of a jail. Right? So this is how you remember British brought in rail, mail, jail. Okay. That lays the foundation of rise of the three classes. Again, I am very comfortable in Kerala because I, I, have, I hope I don't have to understand what are the social classes. It is not ninth class, 10th class. What I am referring to is type of people doing similar type of work. There is a peasant class of peasantry, there is a class of uh, uh, workers, there is a class of capitalists, there is a class of uh, uh, managers, right? So three new classes which come up with the coming of British, these three new classes are number one, businessmen, industrialists. Sorry, there will be lesser reference of Kerala, but I will try to bring in Kerala in the later phase. Uh, so, three industrial, like this industrialist class comes up, Tata, Birla, Bajaj, Singhania, Dalmia, etc, etc. 
in a setup industry, who will work in the industry? Tata is not going to do the labor. Birla is not going to do the labor. So work, labor work will be done by working class. And the third group which comes up to which most of us belong is a modern educated classes. Please note earlier seminary was there, madrasa was there, gurukul was there. But modern education is a different cup of tea. Whatever you say. So these classes I refer as a modern rising classes. Rising classes and Indian nationalism goes together. Hold on for a minute. As these classes come up, the older classes, what are the older classes? They are landlords, they are kings mainly and their associates. These classes start feeling threatened. As the social system is changing, equations of power are shifting to the rising classes, modern classes. As a social equation, these people, older classes, landlords, and of course in Hindi, if you don't mind, I'll put the word Raja, Raja, Nawab, Zamidar, Jagirdar. Their power starts threatening, threatened. And these classes I call as a declining classes. So rising classes will be very easy to understand and three representative of rising classes I'll give you. Now, of course, one of the great things which occurred during the uh, colonial period was the liberty to form associations. I'm sure you know during time of kingdoms, there were no such associations. In the reign of Akbar, teachers form associations say, hello, raise our salary, otherwise we'll go on strike. Those things are not there. So now, People associations come up and from these associations different political formations come up and these four political formations are symbol of Indian nationalism please note what are the three major examples there are many there are many I'll miss out many important but three core things I'll bring forward and three of them number one number one Sardar Bhagat Singh representing left, representing socialism, representing communalism, representing working class, representing oppressed class. And the name of his organization was Naujaman Bharat Sabha. Also, Republic, sorry, Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. I hope, uh, and now I'm just requesting you to remember the names and the pattern of names of rising classes, declining classes. Why? You can very well tell me. You can throw Shakespeare on me. You can throw Shakespeare on me saying, hello, what is in the name? Rose should be known by the fragrance, etc. That's true. In individual cases, that's right. Name doesn't matter. But in the name of uh, political organization, name matters a lot. When you talk of Hindu national, Hindu Yuvavahini, or you talk of a communist organization, the name is very important because it reflects their agenda. So from this side, Bhagat Singh, now Jawan Bharat Sabha. The second one comes up, which is very important, which some of us have ignored for a long time, is uh, Dr. Bhim Rao Baba Sahab Ambedkar. He formed various organizations. He fought against caste system to the core, and the, one of the organizations which he formed in the end was Republican Party of India. And the third category group which comes up here, I'm giving the name of four people. Please guess why I'm giving the name of four people. These four people are Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Annie Besant, Sardar Baldev Singh, and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. I hope you can guess. I am not a congressman. Rahul Gandhi has not sent me. Don't worry about it. But the name of the organization is Indian National Congress. So these are the rising classes. Broadly, their names reflect the future aspiration for Indian nation. That's why, of course, uh, recently, uh, you may be remember, there was one of the Congress leaders, Surinder Nath Banerjee. Please remember him always. Because one of his books is very important, which says, India is a nation in the making. So here it's a question that we are making a nation. We are making a nation on the basis of liberty, equality, fraternity. Is it that only men are there in these organizations? No. There are men, there are women. People of one religion? No. People of all religions. People of one caste? No. People of all the castes, all the languages. So this is inclusive nationalism coming up here. Now see the cleverness of the declining people. Everybody is clever in their own domain and they can make up argument. <coughs> Some declining classes come up organizing. First thing is that when their power started getting threatened, landlords and rajas, 
they did not say that they are under threat. They said our religion is under threat. Believe me, you, if you can empty, if you can internalize this sentence, when they felt the threat, they said our religion is under threat. So what will the Muslim landlords and the kings say? Islam khatre mein, Islam in danger, and Hindu rajas and Hindu kings, Hindu dharm khatre mein hai. Religion is not in danger. Religion, what is in danger, are the older values of caste and gender based hierarchy. What are the values on this side? Liberty, equality, fraternity, social justice. I will repeat it hundred times. And what are the values of this side? The values on this side are that of a hierarchy. So please let me explain that Christian fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, Hindu communalism, Hindu, Hindu nationalism, communalism in the name of it, Buddhism, they are all very similar to each other in their values. The struggle is not between Hindus and Muslims, Hindus and Christians. Struggle is between democratic values, aspirations for democratic values versus a trying to retain the older values in the modern times, in the changing times. I hope I have made the point. Times are changing. Times are always changing. Times are always changing. Now this time times are more changing. Why? Because along with the new system, new values are coming in. Women are coming into social space. Dalits are launching social agitations for social justice and everybody is participating in the anti-colonial movement. And when they are part, the, I told you the names of their organization. Now please note the names of these organizations from this side. From this side, of course, in Kerala again, there is a problem here also. Because if I say uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, what party will strike to you? Muslim League. But I will spare that Muslim League which prevails in Kerala. This has slightly different different patterns, so please bear with me. I am not targeting that Indian Union Muslim League, which has slightly different characteristics. But Muhammad Ali Jinnah, what is the name of the party? Muslim League. Then comes a person called Vinayak Damodar Savarkar from our Maharashtra. I hope you have heard his name, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. He was in British jail. We call him brave. We call him brave. And I will explain his bravery. Maybe he is called a Veer Savarkar. So I will tell you his bravery. He went to jail. He repeatedly wrote letters of apology. Sir, Viceroy, he said, telling Viceroy, Sir, forgive me. I am like your son who has gone adrift. You release me, I will come out and assist you. So that's why we gave him the award of Brave Veer Savarkar. And so that name of the organization is what? Hindu Maha Sabha. Muslim? Lee, Hindu Mahasabha. So Hindu Mahasabha, Savarkar <coughs> brings forward the word Hindutva and he says, we have nothing to do with Indian nationalism. What we want is a Hindu nationalism. And taking this Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, one organization was formed in 1925, which has very strong presence in your state. And you can guess the name of this organization. I'm sure of that. Earlier, they were wearing half pants. Now these are they are wearing full pants. I hope you understand. So, and what what is the goal of their organization? Hindu Rashtra. So please note, friends. Here I will not go into the details of that. So on this side there is Navajavan Bharat Sabha, Republican Party of India, Bharti Rashtriya Congress, and on this side you see Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, and for Hindu Nation RSS. So this is on one side. Now, so three types of nationalism come. That's why my Indian nationalism has a challenge from nationalism from this side. Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, RSS. But are people supporting them? Are all the Hindus with Hindu Mahasabha RSS? No. At that time, in 1937 elections, Hindu Mahasabha could garner 2% votes. Muslim League could garner 3% votes of all whatever that be. So Muslims and Hindus are not with them. <coughs> Majority of Indians are on the side of Indian nationalism. So three nationalism. So nationalism number one, Indian nationalism. What are the characteristics? Incorporates everybody. It says we are a nation in the making. And same, same time, there is a subtle thing that you may be Hindu, you may be Muslim, you may be Christian, you may be Sikh, we are all Indians. You may be a male, you may be a female. We are equal Indians. 
and whatever be your caste, irrespective of that, we are equal Indian. Here, what is there? Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, RSS. Now, Indian nationalism is basically best defined by the term India is a nation in the making. Now, in contrast to this, Muslim League, what does it argue? It says, what is this nation in the making business? What is this nation in the making business? We Muslims are a ready-made nation. Easy. You don't have to go to the tailor. So we are a ready-made nation. Since the time Muhammad bin Qasim attacked Sindh in 8th century, since that time we are a Muslim nation. And they regard Muhammad bin Qasim as the first citizen of Pakistan. I was shocked beyond my belief. Somebody can regard the king of that time as a you know, Pakistan which was formed in 1947. So for them, they, uh, Pakistan, ready-made nation because of the Muslim king. They forget that. They forget that Muslim kings had Hindu associates. They forget that Muslim kings were extracting tribute from Muslim peasants also. Is it that a Muslim king, great Muslim king, forgives the tax to the poor, poor Muslim peasants? Never. Does a Hindu king say, ah, oh, you Hindu, me Hindu, bye bye, no taxation, lagan maaf. Was it like that? What is what a stupid view of history they are harboring amongst ourselves? So, Pak Muslim League, in this uh, what? Pakistan, we are a ready made Muslim nation from 8th century. Now, then, will RSS and Hindu Mahasabha remain behind? Uh, you are a Muslim nation from 8th century? We, the Hindus, are a Hindu nation from last 5,000? 8,000? 20,000? Or from infinite times, times of Darwin? Now, this is a tragedy. How do I make sense of this type of nationalism in the name of religion? Number one, nationalism in the name of religion begins from the feudal classes. Number two, later, some educated middle class lawyers also join them. And these people, all of them, they never participate in the freedom movement. I said right in the beginning, Saying that I am a patriot and blowing your chest out till 56 inches is one thing. And to be a real patriot and stand up against the British was another thing. So neither Muslim League nor Hindu Mahasabha. Of course, RSS is of course a different cup of not tea, something else. Anyway, so this is where the matters come. So they keep aloof from freedom movement. Then they keep just blowing the trumpet of great Hindu nation. So, so what is their political agenda? It is not free from agenda, please no, there is an agenda behind that. What is the agenda? Now I see, I hope I am not repeating this point, I see that India's freedom movement, here I may disagree with my comrades on the left side, I may disagree and I will say that India's freedom movement was a mini revolution. Why it was a mini revolution? It was not a revolution like uh, October revolution of Russia or China, but it was a revolution all the same. Why it was a revolution? It overthrew the principles of hierarchy, of birth base. It talked of liberty, equality, fraternity, social justice. That's why it was a military revolution. And I see two major symbols of this, which came into form modern India. One was Ambedkar, which is beautiful constitution, and summarizing whole constitution in the preamble of the constitution. And second, the architect of modern India, Jawaharlal Nehru. So these, here comes modern India. And on this side, there is everybody. Now, just to summarize, what is the agenda of this side? What is the agenda of this side? I will take one representative from this side. One representative from this side. For my choice, I can take Bhagat Singh also. I can take Gandhi also. But I'll take Ambedkar. What does Ambedkar do? Ambedkar struggles for social justice. And he tries to enter into Hindu temples. They are denied that. He tries to go to the popular um, tank for drinking water. They are denied that. Then he comes to burn a book. He supports burning of a book. I hope you know this episode where Ambedkar supported burning of a book. The name of that book is Manusmriti. When burning Manusmriti, Ambedkar might have said, Manusmriti gives the provisions of slavery. Manusmriti gives us provisions of slavery for shudras and women. I am opposed to that, that I am burning this book. Same Ambedkar goes on to become the chief architect of Indian constitution 
chairman of drafting committee of drafting committee of india's constitution and i have repeated 10 times what does indian constitution gives us so ambedkar is here burning manusmriti opposing hierarchy of caste and gender and talking of equality and there is another person i don't know whether you have heard his name or also not uh k sudarshan you are not heard good i am happy about it he was chief of rss in 2000 he became the chief he gave an interview to the outlook magazine this is the i think it has been deleted from the <coughs> website such as i don't know he gave an interview saying that indian constitution is based on the western values throw it away and bring in a constitution based on ancient hindu holy scriptures can you guess which book he is hinting at for manus for constitution manuscript and let me ask you please respond to me indian constitution is western or modern modern so here there is a confusion that whatever is modern whatever is based on individual liberty is looked at as western so here tambedkar burn manusmriti bringing in indian constitution stand for indian nationalism and here is this nationalism in the name of religion here i am i am bringing them all together yeah you know all all the fundamentalists of the world deny because they have the same values what are those values hierarchy of birth and uh, birth based hierarchy of caste and gender caste may be in different forms it may be in the class form it may be in the caste form that i am not but again but basically fundamentalist communalist those doing politics in the name of religion have same values when when i hear taliban coming and threatening women that if you come to the schools will kill you when they come to kashmir they try to uh, throw acid on the women who are going to the society and all that and when i see the people like pramod mutalik the uh, what is that pracharak of rss pracharak of rss getting the girls beaten in mangalore i don't see any conceptual difference the basic point is the same so basically what i am saying that today hindu nationalist and again please note we are not talking against hinduism because the greatest hindu of our times has been mohandas karamchand gandhi and he was killed by a hindu nationalist so this is where we have to show the mirror to ourselves that what is what is following a religion and what is doing the politics in the name of religion is two different thing anyway so indian nationalism faces a danger mainly with the organizations like rss formed in 1925 kept totally aloof from the freedom movement and it keeps training pracharaks you must have recently read our ex president confused or ambitious i don't know why he goes and addresses rss cadres <coughs> those who are becoming pracharak he forgets that one of these pracharaks had killed father of the nation he forgets that these pracharaks are infiltrated everywhere he forgets that these pracharak don't believe in indian nationalism they are indoctrinated brainwashed to believe in hindu nationalism our ex president with due respect forgot all this and he said he will convert them to indian nationalism not possible you can't convert hitler to become a democrat that's that's my last word anyway poor fellow he went now his daughter also warned him for dad why you are going there they will use your photo they will say and the third day i was in a tv show and was that fellow from uh, bajrangam he said ah Why you are criticizing our organization? You know, Pranab Mukherjee came to address us. I said, thank you very much. I want to say of you, I am more doubtful now of Pranab Mukherjee. So this is where now what did they do? That now there are two type of things I am comparing and contrasting. Indian nationalism, religious nationalism. Sorry, not religious nationalism. That is the wrong terminology. Nationalism in the name of religion. So what is the difference? Here we talk of issues, bread, butter. shelter employment health education jobs what do we talk here we talk here <laughs> our ancient glorious times everything was good women were equal caste were equal fantastic society now problem came because of outsiders muslim came this spoiled our society very nice internal problems transferred externally you forget manusmriti when were you keep blaming others for the ills of this society first you have to look inside but of course very clever they kept propagating propagating uh, these muslims very bad 
Christians now last 20 years, Christians also also very bad. They are also converting, converting, converting. Interesting, they found out about Christians. Because in Kerala, I think Christians are also in good number, Muslims are also in good number, Hindus are also in good number. I found out that what a brilliant propaganda it is. That in 1971, the percentage of Indian Christians were 2.6%. And 2011, it became 2.3%. Can you believe it? From 2.3%, 6% it falls on 2 points. And you go and kill pastor's friends. Hello, you have come to convert here. We will kill you, etc. etc. So this is what the power of propaganda is. And in this power of propaganda, Muslims become aliens. They forget that the first mosque in India did not come up in Delhi. It did not come in Delhi. It came up in Kerala, Cheraman Juma Mosque. And the Islam did not come in North India first. First it came into Kerala. All actually I mean, in Vedas, there is a beautiful sentence. Anu Bhadra Kratvo Yantu Vishwata. Let the noble thoughts come to us from all the universe. Forgetting that these type of things are being said. Now today where do we stand? Today we stand at a place where lot of propaganda against religious minorities, against progressive values, against liberal values have been taken to the sky. You take the example of Kanaya Kumar. I hope he has visited Kerala. Poor fellow, he is saying we want freedom from poverty, we want freedom from hierarchy and he, a, a duplicate video is made, duplicate video is made, doctor video is made and he says, oh, you are anti-national, you are shouting like that. Actually those people who shouted the slogan, they were not arrested. Again I have a lot of doubts about that. Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Where is it written in constitution? Constitution says respect the values of Indianness, respect tricolor, respect this thing, and if you say Jahin, that is good enough. But these issues, and then comes up Bharat Mata Ki Jai, then comes up Gau Hamari Mata Hai, Gau Zawar Mother, fantastic. Of course, I am not having an interactive session now, but sometimes I have an interactive session. In one college I went, there I said, hello, you know, some people say, cow is like, cow is our mother. So some students stood up. They said, sir, if cow is our mother, who is our father? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Now, then I come to know Vivekanand, Swami Vivekanand. He writes that beef was a common food in ancient India. Hello, not me. Swami Vivekanand, Professor D. N. Jha, Mithapoli cow. Beef was prevalent in the country. 80% of the world, west world, east world, eats beef. What is the problem? Poor Dalits are here, we are eating beef. Adivasis were eating beef. What is the problem? Now, so what? Gau Hamari Mata, Gau Lynching, Junaid, Akhla, and there are infinite number of cases which are going on. What is this issue to discuss? I know. You think of the nutrition of the poor, give them proper nutrition. What is this Gau Hamari Mata? Hai? You do, you keep Gau in your proper place, and we have no problem. Why are you letting her eat plastics in tons and tons and they are getting killed? So, this is a hypocrisy. And Gandhi had an answer for that. Gandhi was approached July 1947. Babu, we are going to become independent. So why don't we ban cow slaughter? Why don't we ban beef? Babu says, hello, this is not just a country for Hindus. This is a country of everybody. So why we should try to do things which are uncomfortable to others? So that is, then Ram Temple. Now as a believer, or believer will say, Tulsidas, there are great people who have created great literature and I remember the great Muslim scholars in Kerala who have written excellent pieces on Ramayana. But whether it is necessary to break the mosque to build a temple, I don't know. Because Tulsi Das himself, the greatest, one of the most popular writer of North India, he himself was living in the mosque while writing books etc. etc. So these are all emotive issues. So friends, finally I say, Indian nationalism faces challenge not from outside, it faces challenge from inside and that challenge is in the name of Hinduism. Actually, I think it is the abuse of morality of Hindu religion to do politics in the name of Hindutva. I don't see it any glorious way. Line on the lines of Mahatma Gandhi, I feel Hinduism should teach the whole world is my family, Vasudhaya Kutumbakam. 
targeting of minorities in the name of beef, love jihad, etc. You know the case of Hadiya, I don't have to repeat that. That is the danger to our democracy. And democracy, Indian constitution, Indian nationalism, they are all synonymous to me. Friends, we can have question answers. We can. I'd like to answer your question. But basically, I feel that what we achieved during freedom movement is being undermined by issues in the name of identity. Issues which raise the emotional pitch of people, which incite the people, incite the people to kill innocent people carrying carrying something in their bag, eating, having something in the refrigerator, eating something in the name of temple and what else you have, all these dangerous things. I must say that Indian nationalism has to be strengthened and for that, all this propaganda, Muslims are like this, Christians are like this, this is a foundation for creating hatred. Believe me you, without hatred, violence does not take place and that violence is not taking place automatically. The study from Yale University, I don't know, have you heard of Yale University? I had not heard earlier, but then our MHRD minister told us, I have, oh, while you are saying I am illiterate, I have brought a degree from Yale University. I came to know about Yale University, so I started following it. I came to know from Yale University, one of the research says that wherever, number one, violence does not take place automatically. It is orchestrated. And wherever a violence takes place, one party becomes more powerful, which so far was not there in Kerala, but you had to be frightened, you have to be warned about the presence of that party also. That party becomes powerful after every communal violence anyway. Anyway, so finally what do we do? We have to protect Indian constitution. We have to protect Indian nationalism. We have to make it stronger by bringing the values where the hatred towards religious minorities undermine. Where violence is prevented. Number two, where the basic issues of society related to survival, related to life, related to employment, related to health. Those issues have to be brought to the forefront. And today the time has come that all those people believing in secularism, democracy, Indian constitution, if we don't hang together, will we have hang separately? That is the moral of the story I want to say. That is a time we should have differences. That is a sign of life. Differences are the foundation of democracy, but faced with ideologies which basically want to undermine democracy, what do you do? Please hang together till the clouds of this darkness, till the clouds of nationalism in the name of religion go wither away, till that time hang together, promote the values of amity, love and harmony in the society. That is the only way to protect Indian nationality. Thank you very much.